All right, here we are, short story long, with Pasqual. Am I saying that right, Pasqual? Right? People say Pasquale and Pasqual. Yeah. Do what you. do you prefer? Pasqual. Pasqual is what most people okay. say. Okay. I've just heard it every different way. Yeah. And on the way in here today, I'm like, damn, I don't know which way is the right way. The right way it's, is Pasquale, but. Damn, that's um, nobody, ba barely anyone says okay. that. My, my mom said that. So my Ohio <laughs> verbiage will say Pasquale Rotella. Yeah. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for making this happen. Yeah, thanks for coming and having me. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, you do a podcast? Is that right? Yeah, I do a show called Night Owl Radio. Yeah. I do it once a week. It, it airs on uh, Sirius XM. Dope. That was that with different... Um, artists and stuff or who do you have on there yeah i have different guest djs and i do some interviews on there and i talk a lot a lot about the shows that i have coming up yeah that's dope yeah um so for those of you who don't know pasqual is the creator of insomniac which is the massive massive what would you call it event company yeah it's a Create, we do so many different things, yeah. but live events is our is our main focus. Yeah, so that's Festivals. EDC. What else? EDC Escape, which is going down this weekend. Yeah, um, Beyond, um, Base Rush, Factory ninety three. Um, we have a lot of different, a lot yeah. of different brands. You own it, man, and you do such a good job. And all of your the one thing that me because I don't. I don't usually go to those sort of things. They're a little, uh, they give me anxiety. You know, like I'm a, I'm a bit of a homebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like every time I see them, what you own, I just feel like more than anyone is like the lights and the giant sculptures and the, everyone's dressed up in like tutus and neon. Like people are really like real fans of this thing you've created. And everything's so, like the brand is just strong. I don't know. That's what it, to me, outside looking in, one thing about all of Insomniac events is like, they're just all so next level and look like an experience, you know? Yeah, we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and passion into what we're doing. There's events that have all the, you know, the big production stages and all that, and then we do more underground stuff, just warehouses, minimal production, yeah, and everything in in between, yeah, you know. So, but yeah, it's it's a it's a beautiful culture. There's a a lot of passionate people that are involved and it's it's amazing to see this many people come together and put so much into themselves whether it's their outfits or the energy they're putting out yeah. when they're dancing and coming at the show and it's uh it's something i've been doing for a long time starting as just a fan yeah. i was just going to the events yeah. back in the day and really it changed my life in a big way and yeah. i was attracted to it so let's talk about that you're from glendale is that right I was born in I was born in Glendale. Okay. I lived in uh, Glassell Park when I was really young. Uh, Where's Eagle that? Rock, Glassell Park. It's like oh, Eagle, e Rock? Eagle Rock Got it. area, Got it. yeah. And then I moved to Venice yeah. and then to the West Side, Santa Monica, Pacific Palisades. I lived on the West Side. Jeez, why Why did you move around so much? My parents were hustling, just you know, tr trying to make it happen. They They you know went from being you know, in Eagle Rock on the east side. Yeah. And, um, trying to make ends meet to Venice Beach, opening a pizza joint near the boardwalk. Yeah. Uh, an Italian um, restaurant to then uh, doing even better and going to Santa Monica, then the Palisades yep. eventually. So they're just hustlers. Yeah, they were immigrants. I'm first generation born here, Italian. Yeah. And, you know, my dad, they, Really came from nothing and built the American dream. I That's think so they did cool. Well, yeah. You think that like heavily affected you and your sort of like entrepreneurial spirit? A absolutely. I, I was with them at work. They worked twenty four seven. So yeah. the way that I was able to be with my parents was just hanging out in the restaurant, washing dishes, busboying, yep, and uh, helping s sweeping up at, at the end of the night. And what type of did they ever tell you like? Did they try to embed that in you, do you think, that spirit? Or do you think that they let you just kind of watch and do whatever you wanted to do? Or like what was their what they kind of put on you? At a young at a young age, they I would just witness them yeah. putting everything they had into it, what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And then my mom would just dream so big. I mean, she would have literally no money, but would search out the owner of a building 
and start negotiating to buy the building. Yeah. And it had no no dough yeah. at all, you know? <laughs> she was just like that. So that, you know, entrepreneur um, uh, energy and, 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 you know, what the way she would talk to people definitely is inside me. Yeah. But as I got older, my, my, my mom was my biggest supporter mm -hmm. when I started throwing warehouse parties. And, you know, my, my pops was a little uh, unsure yeah. of what I, what I was doing. He, he did construction. Yep. So he would take me in his, in his truck into some construction sites and help him here and there. This was after the restaurant. And, uh, you know, he wanted me to help him do that, but I wanted to throw... Yeah. underground parties yeah <laughs> i can only imagine for a, like a construction working father you'd be like i don't know about this one son you know what i mean like what are you <laughs> was... looking at warehouses and like ah let yeah me, well come over to the site with me and let's work on a yeah and i got in some something. trouble too so he wasn't yeah you know, he had to bit, pick me up uh, bail me out of jail a few times for doing really? illegal warehouse parties yeah so he didn't really it didn't really give him a lot of confidence yeah. that this was the right direction yeah man damn you really beat the odds you know what I mean? Yeah. Because like all things, what, what age were you? Like 16 or something? I was uh, 15, 16 when I was going to the parties. And then my first event, I was 17 years old. Yeah. Through it. Yeah, I just think all things considered, like getting arrested at 17, trying to throw raves, like most, I think for most people that doesn't work out. You know what I mean? You ended up building a fucking empire. Yeah. But I, I just think you beat the odds. Yeah, it actually bums me out because there were so many beautiful, awesome people that were in the scene back then yeah and i look around and you know they've contributed to building this culture and and they've stuck they stuck with it for many years and not a lot of them are yeah why do you think that around is, you think you get like caught up in the actual party i think no i mean some people do yeah. uh, and those people come and go pretty quickly yeah you can only rage and 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 Try to run do drugs business. or yeah. whatever for so long that those people lives were pretty short-lived in the scene yeah but no there's some serious cats that really loved it and put their heart and soul into it that were smart but you know they they, they just couldn't move, go forward i mean you could only yeah i mean really there's no money in this for almost two decades yeah and top ramen barely making rent yeah um, because, yeah some people just can't yeah you just you, it's, it's it's hard you know yeah um, and then the, the legal issues with it would, you would always see some, some lifers, well, who I thought were lifers drop off when there was a big surge of like police raids or rave task force or yeah. crack house law. There was this big law going on there, putting promoters in jail for like 20 years uh, for throwing parties. Yeah. People start disappearing, you know? Yeah, man. You've dodged so many bullets. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It's a crazy industry because it's just like I don't know. I don't know much about it, but it just seems like you got to fight through so much shit to like build what you've built. You know what I mean? You got to be strong-willed. It's it's been uh, hard at times, but at the same time, when you love it, it, part of it's easy though because when I'm actually working on the shows, yeah. Although it's a lot of work, when you love it, it makes it a lot easier. You know, you know, with your line, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you're passionate about it. Yeah. And you know, it makes it a lot easier when you love it so yeah. much. I just think if I was threatened to be arrested over making t-shirts, I might have quit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel that. Um, I can relate to that. So, <laughs> like, when you're young, did you have, you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have two sisters. Got it. So, older or younger? Or older. I'm the, I'm, I'm the youngest. How much older? They're, uh, one is almost in her mid Fifty? She won't really tell me. <laughs> I forget, and she won't really. Rem she yeah, won't remind. I'm so young. Yeah. I don't. She's always lied about her birthday. My oldest sister, yeah. but um, my younger sister, who's still older than me, is forty-eight. Something Got like. it. Yeah. Got it. Um, because I asked because I find that a lot of the guests that I have on here are the youngest sibling, and I'm big. I'm the youngest sibling. I'm real big on like the youngest sibling syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Where it makes you really hungry to sort of stand out or make your own way. And I just wonder if you feel like that affected you at all or if that was kind of off your radar. I never thought about it. Maybe. Yeah. The, um, you know, they were crazy girls. You know, when we lived in Venice Beach, they were running around on the boardwalk, um, roller skating down there, you know, getting in trouble. Yeah. And my dad, 
I mean, I was the one who was supposed to look out for everyone. My parents were kind of out yeah. there, yeah. Uh, immigrant, you know, loud, just getting into arguments. I was kind of the mediator. Yeah. I was the youngest. <laughs> yeah. And my dad expected me to look after my sisters because they were the the girls, the women in the family, and yeah. I was supposed to be like the man of the house. So at eight, nine years old, I was running around on the boardwalk. He'd run up on me and just say, you know, where are your sisters? You know, like yeah. worried like, that they were I'm with eight, older dude. dudes. Yeah. And well, he, you know, he took care of his whole family at, at eight years yeah. old. He used to, um, so he expected that of me, uh, you know, and he wasn't really worried what I was getting into. Yeah. I was down there, uh, break dancing uh -huh. and um, just running around the Venice boardwalk in the mid eighties. And he was more concerned about them. Yeah. And they were, you know, in their, they were teenagers at the time. Yeah. So I think maybe, maybe, maybe that contributed yeah. to me, you know, kind of thinking more about what I was doing and. Yeah. It's just interesting. I feel like as I do these, like you can see kind of these pieces from people's lives that, maybe added to them becoming who, you know what I mean? It just sounds like being able to handle that much responsibility at a young age and being able to, like it just, you can kind of see where maybe these things helped you be able to manage such a chaotic world that you now manage. You know what I mean? Because you had to be a supervisor at eight years old on the Venice Boardwalk. I can't imagine growing up with access to the Venice Boardwalk. Because there's was... anything in the world. Like yeah. just weirdos and anything. Yeah, I, f I feel it's I feel like it's why I I'm I'm in the industry that I'm in. Yeah, because Venice Boardwalk in the mid '80s is kind of like walking into a crazy ass rave. Yeah, you're, right. <laughs> you're <laughs> so dead on. When I um was getting into other things at a young age, graffiti being one of them, yep. and. Um, where there was kind of a neg a little bit of a negative, you know, it was kind of, there was tag bangers and yeah. I was getting kind of crazy for a minute. And then I got dragged to a rave and I felt really good about being there. The, the, the different people expressing themselves in yep. different ways, the dancing. I mean, Venice Boardwalk was, there was all kinds of weirdos. Yeah. And there was all kinds of street performers and there was break dancing and roller skates and music everywhere. Yeah. And art and that's you know i really gravitated to that versus getting r rolled up on because you're part of a crew and jumped yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. that was yeah. not uh which was kind of what was where a lot of my friends were going yep and uh it, i just i loved it you know and, and from then on i went pretty much every every chance i got and so how old were you when you went to your first one when i went to my first rave, rave yeah uh i was 16 years old got it and you just, the moment you went in there, you're like, this is cool. The, I like, do you remember like walking in away. the first, first one you ever went to, walking in the... I did. I remember going to the first map point before even getting to the party. Uh -huh. And actually someone came up to me, that scene was a lot older than compared to, you know, I was 16 and someone tapped me on the head and was like, kid, shouldn't you be home by now? And I, and I was just tripping out on everyone's clothes and... The people were wearing like big top hats and overalls, yeah. oversized clothes, you know, overalls and stuff like that. And then walking into the party, I, I was, yeah, real, real blown away. I'll never forget that moment. And then, what really I enjoyed was the dance circles. Yeah, they don't exist really anymore at the events too much. I mean, here and there, but there was um, a lot of graffiti artists that were going to the underground parties yeah. even before ra they were called raves. And there was a lot of dance circles where people were, you know, pop locking, break dancing. Uh, um, they called them housers doing like this, this footwork and stuff like that. Yeah. Dudes would have like canes yeah. and like they would fold up and yeah. do all kinds of, you know, it was, it was, it was cool. Um, and that was, a, a, you know, the dancing part of it and the music was a big focus yeah. at that time. So did you ever get into like sports or anything more like formal or, or you knew from early like that's not for me? I was, no, I, I was at a very young age. I was into break dancing and then it was uh, graffiti and skateboarding and I got really into, I was surfing yeah. uh, yeah. a lot and then I I was introduced to, to underground yeah. culture. And then so when, so that was like 16, you said you went to your first one, and by 17, 
you had you were throwing your first event. By 17, I, I threw my first, not, my, my company's name is Insomniac. Yeah. I didn't throw my first Insomniac till 93, but in 92, I did something called the Unity Groove, and uh, that was my first party event that I threw. And um, and then from then, you know, then moving forward, I, I, I did Insomniac after that first one. Yeah, and what's the process of like, that first event, like you go find a warehouse. That that was still when it was illegal the way you were doing it, or no? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, yeah, we were doing it illegally. So you yeah. just like find a warehouse. Like, how's that go down? I guess what I'm saying is like being that young, going from like, oh, I love to like this rave thing is something I'm into. I like this. Um, I want to do my own. Which that alone at 16 is like a pretty. Most people are like, I love raves. Where I want to just go to raves for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> right. So to like at 17, be like, I want to actually throw one of these. But what's the process? Like you go find a space and then you promote it or how do you? Well, I first went to school really by going, being part of it as a fan uh-huh. and going to map points, going to different warehouses. You know, I learned a lot about the city. You know, I was, even though I was born on the east side and grew up there as a small kid, I really was a west sider mm-hmm. and, and, and didn't leave Venice, Santa Monica, Malibu Palisades, that whole area. Yeah. And Underground Parties kind of brought me out into downtown LA, East LA, Vernon. You mentioned yeah, before yeah. we started the Lots show that warehouses. your warehouse is out there. <laughs> Actually, there's no more warehouses party, warehouse parties there because um, anyway, some crazy shit down, went down there way <laughs> back in the day and the, and the, the guy who, the city uh, government that isn't down with parties there. But yeah. Um, you know, I learned about the city by going to these parties. So that was kind of my first introduction to, you know, without knowing it, I was just going there as a fan, but really on where the parties were taking place and how, you know, I had to, I mean, it was, it was a adventure finding the party yeah. when you were going to someone else's party. Yeah. So I had those same adventures trying to find abandoned warehouses and locations and open fields yeah. and what have you when I was trying to organize my own events, it kind of felt the same in a lot of ways to, to trying to find where the parties were taking place when yep. I was just an attendee. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first step was finding a finding a spot. And I guess what's the, I mean, not to go too deep in, I'm just curious, like what makes a good spot? Like, is it kind of off the beaten path where you won't get busted quick? There's enough room? There's, or like, what is, what do you look for? In the early days, it was about not getting busted. Yeah. It was finding a, a, a location where you know we wouldn't we wouldn't get shut down in those days we, every event was the goal was to go to sunrise yeah i got it and if you got busted at you know any you know before 2 a.m it was a it was a fail it's a flop yeah um anything after two was was okay yeah but if you went to seven eight in the morning you're just you made ki- it killed it ah that's so cool yeah so you'd like celebrate if the sun comes up. You're like, yeah. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good feeling when the sun would come through in the warehouse. You know, the cracks in the in in the ceiling and in, in the metal sheets yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was a real sense of accomplishment when you would go to yeah. sunrise back then. And at that age, were you like partying while you were there, or were you always pretty like focused? No, I never uh, partied. You That's know, crazy. I, de- definitely not at my own parties. I mean, I was always. You know, at one point I got curious and experimented, but it's not really my my thing. Yeah. I like to be in control, and yeah. uh, and I really get so much joy out of meeting people and the music, and you know, just the dancing, and, and you know, just I love I love so all all of it. You know, I love how people walk through the doors, and it's okay for them to be cool their best selves Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know you don't you know people are such you know a lot more present on on you know at these events yeah um especially in the in the early days you know when you're when you're uh partying right you're you're not present and you're not and i'm i'm you know although i've uh i'm not knocking it and not judging yeah you know it's part of the culture um it's not it's not where i get my joy out. yeah 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 that's good man. i think that's like obviously one of your massive strong points like i said i think 90 percent of 17 year olds 
especially if they don't go to their first rave and like just turn into like a full bore raver, then they throw a successful event at like 17. They're, I'm getting wasted. If that's me, I'm like, look at me, I'm the king of the world. Yeah. You know, at 17. No, I, I was, uh, yeah, just level I, after, after every event, I, I think, you know, I, I'm thinking about what we didn't do right yeah. and what needs to be better next time. And that's still the, the case today. Yeah. So was the first event a success? Did you make it till sunup or the first success? When I look back now, it was a success. But when I was doing it, yeah, it was it was um, well. The first one felt pretty good actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I did it on the corner of Slauson and Crenshaw. Jesus, back in the day, and this was right before you know, right, a year after the LA riots. Yeah, so that was you know, yeah, Not the, the, the hood area. right there. Yeah. Um, and I was stoked because we did go till uh, seven in the in the morning. Jesus! And uh, it was the second insomniac event that wasn't. Uh, Is that where you got arrested? Uh, no, just got busted. Yeah, just got busted. So when they bust you, do they just pull up, say everyone's got to leave, or do they look for who's in charge, or like how's that go down? Everyone just scatters. Well, there's been different phases. You know, there's been times where there was a time period where they would just bust the event up. Yeah. Everyone would go home, and then there was times where the police or vice was a lot more aggressive, and yeah. they would not only bust the event up, but they would repossess the equipment, uh, yeah. or yeah. they would pat every, you know, or start arresting people, find the event promoter, yeah, uh, put try to put him in jail for not having you know doing an illegal party and all got that. Got it. Got it. Um, what was the first one where you got arrested? The first time I got arrested was in West LA. I did a break in <laughs> warehouse party at a at a spot in West LA, and I already announced where the event was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I already printed up the maps for the map point, and there just wasn't enough power in the building, mm -hmm. and I. We actually climbed the fence to the, um, I think it was a Home Depot next door, mm -hmm. and we tapped into their power oh, because man. we were just people were on their way. The yeah. party had to happen. Yeah, and this warehouse was, uh, yeah, just couldn't couldn't facilitate what we needed. So we, um, and back then you'd bring in. It was all about the wall of speakers. You know, we didn't have budget to hang sound. Yeah, yeah. and there was this giant speaker walls and people would praise these speaker walls instead of facing the dj they'd be praising these speaker walls so it's all about the 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 sound how loud it was how big the wall was so we need a lot of power so we basically climbed the fence ran the cables tapped into their power boxes and some alarm went off uh -huh. and uh, that was the first time yeah i got arrested so that happens because they show up and they say whose party is this and you have to be like Please, yeah and i was I went up to the police and, and said, hey, you know, we're just doing a, uh, what was my excuse that time? I was a, like a, at a record label, yeah. you know, release party. And I wasn't running the party. This older dude is running it. But he said, if, you know, if you guys came to come speak to you and yeah. uh, <laughs> they were like, well, you're Congratulations. with us. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, um, Something that really stands out to me was the second time was at the Hollywood Soundstage, which was a movie shoot location on Las Palmas and Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh -huh. And that time it got raided by Vice. Uh -huh. And that was the second time I got in trouble. And they came in there full force. Everyone was like on the ground. And, and that was uh, a different experience than the first. But... Yeah, and and you know it made it made me grow though those experiences, and yeah. I then went from being completely illegal to semi legal. Yeah, and then so it's semi legal like you start to get permits and you start to like how do you? Well, let me ask you this too because I'm curious about this. When this happened, because that you mentioned it, like were your so your parents didn't make you quit, right? They were just kind of like, ah, eh, we're unsure about what you're doing, but they believed in you to be like, ah, eh, we we just believe that at the end of the day you're going to figure this out. Oh no, my my mom was working the door. Oh man, that's amazing. My mom was working the door. Like, was she there when you got arrested? Yeah, she was there when I got arrested. That's yeah. Amazing. So she, she didn't know she was that helpful. was happening, and I definitely tried to 
avoid her being involved because she's really, she would have been Yelling talking shit cop. to the cops. Yeah, <laughs> like, what are you doing with my son? <laughs> He's in not to do nothing wrong. You know, you, you, like she would have been acted as if they were guilty for yeah. for taking hundred percent in a mom's eyes they are incidents. guilty yeah yeah so she was always always had my back was always you know supporting me working the doors and then she would hit the dance floor oh, after so cool. too she she loved it she yeah. was up until she uh passed away um three years ago she was on the stages rocking out she was uh 79 years old and Jesus. she was a so much energy she was there till sunrise all the time that had to be crazy for them because i mean i'm guessing at that time they didn't see or care about any like financial future in that right they just thought like our son's doing what he loves to do right yeah i don't think she saw i don't i don't know if i never talked to her about the money side That's she was mean, just so. supportive because she saw how happy i was and she was so proud of what i was doing like know? so to see it go all the way to like a vegas this massive i don't know that just has to be pretty cool for a yeah for, a parent. No, for her to see that i was i was i'm forever grateful that she was able to witness that and how happy it made her made me feel even better about what I was doing. Yeah. So then your dad was a little like cautious of it, but didn't tell you to stop or anything. No, he well, he would just give me you know shit like a little bit here and there, but he never said stop. You know, he knew I wouldn't, and he wasn't uh, like that with me. He never yeah. told me what to do, but you know, he was just kind of questioning it here and there. Yeah. But then I took him to the L.A. Coliseum and <laughs> walked him through. Uh, or just him looking out onto the into the crowd, and that I remember that moment of him just not understanding what, what the fuck happened. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, like what is this? Yeah, and that was cool to see. That's so cool, man. Yeah, because it's just when something is in physical form, and it goes from like you know breaking into a warehouse all the way from physically being able to walk through a venue that's massive and lit up, and there's all these people, and it's 100 percent legitimate. Like that's just cool, you know. Yeah, no, it's and you know people. That energy too that the people put out, you know, it's a it's a it's a pretty positive energy, and even if you're not into it or don't, you know, the music, you're not into the music, you know that you can see that people are are loving it. Yeah, and you know the scale is is uh, is interesting to see as well. Yeah, it's cool. I would love to go to one. I need to witness it. I just need to have like a very specific plan. You know, like I can't just roll like go me. out there and like. Well, I don't know what's happening. No, dude, roll with. Roll, yeah, anytime. Roll with me. We, I would love you know, to. And then we can, you know, we don't have to be in the mix. I like going out into the crowd. And, yeah. And no, I'm down for through. that. But w there's also uh, this this deck area. You can. You yeah. Know, be out of yeah, the I'd mix. love to witness it. Yeah. It's great. Please come. Um, so, what is the road to like legalizing and legitimizing? these things you know what i mean you said you started to get kind of half legal and then you you know what i mean like what does that mean well it was hard to get we weren't really accepted anywhere even when i in the underground days when i got in you know trouble here and there i tried to go legit yeah. but the stigma attached to these events was just super bad yeah and no one was willing to take the risk at one point especially i when i was 17 i looked like i was probably you know 14 or 15 uh, i thought years you were old. gonna go up i was like oh that's good you look 30. You no know I, mean? I, looked, I looked 14's bad no i looked young and they were just like kid get out yeah, out of like, here hey, I'm in charge you want to throw what dance a rave yeah. get get out of here yeah. there's no way we don't do those things and they would just hang up or yeah so it was it was difficult to get in the door yep the first time really it happened was at the la sports arena Yep. And I did it through uh, someone else. Uh -huh. And that was really the first time. I did it through this. There was this company that built theme parks uh -huh. uh, called Landmark Entertainment. And the dude had a beard and was probably in his you know, 50s or whatever it was. And he was an investor and he liked, he saw the vision. He was a creative dude and saw these events as being like pop up theme parks potentially yeah, in, in the yeah. future, and he invested, and it was my first time really not using my own dough. And even when I was using my own dough, I, I didn't really have the money. It was kind of like sell pre sale, run to the skate shop or yeah. the record shop, pull the money from the, yeah. the you know the 
the the um the sales and then start paying stuff as the money came in. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time really getting any sort of support on that level, and then bringing him in, and he came in there with the landmark entertainment brand. Yeah. Uh, and you know, which was a corporate, you know, corporation and an older dude that wasn't from the scene and stuff like that. So yeah. we got into the LA Sports Arena. Got it. And did our first real, real legit event at a, at a, at a, at a proper venue and was that a moment for you like do you remember being like we did it like we made it legit i was super yeah yeah i felt like we were on our no it felt like we were on our way yeah because there was still the challenge of of having it all make sense you know we were still losing money at the time and but it, we were we were chipping away at it slowly yeah and that was you know that year to year we were just chipping away slowly yeah there wasn't leaps Mm -hmm. Till the 2000s, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there was just really you felt you saw a big difference from year to year, yep. and that's when it crossed over and it was yeah it was a lot better. Did you see like at a young age when you were first doing the just the Insomniac events? Did you see the vision of what it is today or what it could have been, or were you just kind of doing it because you loved it? Let's just get the next event. Let's figure it out. Or did you have these big visions? Both. Yep. You know, I, I, I loved it and, uh, you know, I love it and uh, I did see a big vision, but it wasn't, it wasn't like I, I was looking at a spreadsheet and I was like, this is going to make sense yeah. eventually. <laughs> yeah. It was more of a dream, you know, a thought in my head or a vision in my head of like just a massive amount of people just going off yeah. and just loving it. Yeah. It was more that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that there was going to be that much interest in that. You know, it was going to be that good. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. And at that time, you're essentially, am I right in thinking that like the basic economics are you're just, you're trying to get as many people to show up as you can. You're paying the costs of sound and all that stuff. And you're trying to offset that as much as you can with tickets. Or or is there something I'm missing as far as trying to get into the, On to the making money of instead of losing it when you're, when you're young, I'm saying like up until let's say the 2000s when you're still kind of losing money or breaking even or is that the struggle is that kind of what it looked like yeah that well the struggle was on many fronts it was on you know breaking even it was on getting venues not getting busted not yeah. getting in trouble trying to legitimize things um also not being creative you know yeah. and being doing something different because there was a lot of people at one point that jumped into the culture and you wanted, you know, your shit to be different yeah. and stand out and better. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, being successful was, you know, not just financially based. It, financially based, it was like, how good was your party? Yeah. How unique was your venue? Did it get go all night? Um, you know, did because you get I, this yeah. act, this DJ to play? How sick was your flyer? Was it better than theirs? Did it die? Was it a die cut gatefold? You know, yeah. foil. Were you the first one to do this or that? You know, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's your competitive. I mean, lot. I like that. You know, just like with skating or surfing or, uh, you know, tagging. You know, it was like, do you, how good was your piece? Yeah, did you yeah. get up on that billboard or that, you know, that that freeway sign? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. who was all city? You know, it was the same yeah. same thing. You know, who could like get higher? On, you know, high, Ollie higher, what, whatever it is. You know, it was yeah. the same the same kind of kind of qualities. Thing, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. I get that. I get that because you have to make sure that every insomniac, like whenever it says insomniac, it's the best party ever, right? That's the that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Damn it. Um, so what happened in the two thousands that started to kind of click a little bit more? There was. The LA Coliseum that mm -hmm. that really helped take things to another level. Really, even when we were doing forty thousand, fifty thousand people, it, it was almost like no one was watching. Yeah, you know, the you know that's how you felt. The media. Well, I mean, no one was covering it, and people yeah. didn't realize. But people would constantly walk in and be like, "What the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, where, where am I? You know, it, I didn't even know this happened." Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until the LA Coliseum. People started paying attention. The media started paying attention. There was all these crossover. There's this coll these collaborations that were happening on the music side of things, yep. like 
Black Eyed Peas were doing stuff with dance music artists and yep. you know and w- Will I Am actually was w- used to go to underground parties back in the day. Really, we used to go together. <laughs> he came to EDC at the Coliseum. He hadn't seen it for a long time and was just like. What happened? <laughs> yeah. This is where it's gone. This yeah. is crazy. Yeah. And he was always a fan. He was a dope dancer in junior high and and at the raves. He was always a one of the best dancers in the circles and stuff like that. Yep. And, and you know when he you know he had been doing his thing and blown up as an artist. And when he came and seen yeah. where he, these parties that he used to go to yeah. where that had gone, you know I think it sparked something in him and. Oh, you know, he definitely helped. You know, Black Eyed Peas kind of helped cross things over because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he, you know, he had a connection with it from back in the day, and then, you know, felt it for real. So yeah, that's huge. It is thing. Is that when? So that wasn't the first EDC, right? The Coliseum. No. So when did you have the sort of like, I don't know, the the thought or the presence of mind to like start to break these up into different events as opposed to just doing insomniac parties? Was that pretty early? The, the, I mean, I, I wanted to do parties when the scene died in L.A. Yeah. The, in 91, 92, the L.A. underground scene was thriving. Mm-hmm. By mid-92, 93, when the L.A. riots happened and a lot of, like, shady promoters started coming into, entering the culture, mm-hmm. you'd go to a map point, you'd drive... Two hours, there was just an open field, no sound system, no party. Yeah, people would come back to LA. They'd loot the store they bought the ticket from, uh-huh. and it was a lot of. It was just you know there was, then there. <laughs> You're good. Then there was uh. They were, then there was uh parties that were getting busted. No parties would go like more than a couple hours. Yeah. And uh, there was an influx of like gangsters that discovered the rave scene. Yeah. So you had a huge amount of tag bangers and gangsters and cholos and like crips and stuff that were coming and ravers are easy targets, you yeah. know, when they're especially if they're over beveraged or taking drugs, you know, whatever, you yeah. know. So people would get jacked and yeah. it was just it was not fun and it just and then the rave task force was created and just killed it was done. Yeah. It was a wrap. And I found myself just a lot of it actually happened. I went to the UK uh-huh. to because a lot of most of the music was coming out of the UK back then. Uh-huh. Even though dance music started in America, really raving and the big massive parties started in the UK. Yep. And I went there to search out the best party. Mm-hmm. And when I came back, you know things were really had deteriorated, and uh, that's where I, when I decided I, I need. I want to do part. I want to do events. I want to. It was more about bringing it back. Yeah. So I had somewhere to go, and my friends had somewhere yeah. to go. I was that into it, you know. So, so from then, that time, you were like, did you? That's when you thought of the different sort of creating EDC instead of just everything being Insomniac, and started creating these different. It just seems like you've done a really good job at creating. So the main brand is Insomniac, right? Right. But creating these littler brands under it is just. I don't know if that's normal in your business, but for me, from the outside looking in, it just looks very strong. You've been able to create these different, very strong brands. Yeah, it wasn't. It was not normal back in the day. Yeah, and we were the first ones to to really do that. Um, you know, I'm I'm someone who likes so many different things. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of people that like one thing. Especially these days are different with the internet. People are exposed to so much. Yeah, yeah. You know, it used to be you only like hip hop, or you only like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, gangster rap or whatever. You know, but it, ne- it like it was, you know, you only like trance music or drum and bass or techno. Yeah. And I liked it all, uh-huh. and I I found joy in in all the different style of events, and um. Sometimes there wasn't anyone doing a certain genre or focusing on it. Yep. So I really, you know, I, I, being a fan, I understand the difference between what a, you know, what a bass party is like versus, you know, an underground house music party. Yeah. And I like both vibes and I want to, 
create those experiences and, and dive in. So it really comes from from that. Yeah. Um, also, there was a time period where there wasn't a lot of, you know, there, there used to, at one point, uh, in the, 93, there wasn't really anyone doing parties. We were doing mm-hmm. parties. Mm-hmm. And the scene didn't really grow that much. I mean, we went from like 800 people to 900 people. We were like max at like 13 to 1500 people yeah. on a weekend. What I noticed was when other people started coming into the scene and getting inspired by the parties that we were doing yeah. and throwing their own parties, it brought, brought new people in. Yeah. And their parties and our parties, it, there was synergy. It wasn't like, wait, why are people doing yeah. other parties? It was like, they would feed off each other mm-hmm. and a scene was being developed. Yep. And then more people came in and more people and then more parties and there was 4,000, 5,000, yeah. 10,000 people going. When uh, at one point there was another crash and everyone disappeared. Yeah, we were kind of the only ones around again. Yeah, and I wanted that synergy to exist, and that was another reason why I created new parties because mm-hmm. me doing two parties a year wasn't, br- wasn't bringing enough. that. It yeah. wasn't sat, It wasn't creating that sense of community, right? Yeah, you know, you you'd go out all the time. You'd see the same heads out. It was kind of like recess at high in high school you know yeah. you go and you see your, your your dudes that you never yeah. see you know yeah. or going to the surf spot you know out in the water you know you you, you know two times a year wasn't enough so yeah. we would create more and more parties and that since that community was was being for, you know strengthened and and uh that was another reason why we created different themed events yeah and different style parties at one point as well yeah, it's just really cool to me, man. As a fan of like just brand building, like I said, because it's the same as like you said, same in clothing, same in anything. But building a brand is building a brand, right? You know. But I just think you've done a really good job of brand building in that world. And now, from my perspective, it looks like you just own that scene in the U.S. I might not feel that way to you because you have a better viewpoint of what's going on in that world but to me it's like insomniac just runs that entire genre of parties and of events and of whatever yeah it's it's not you know this it's so important for this culture to have different people yeah doing different things because it keep it makes it exciting you know i i try to support and mentor other groups that are throwing parties for instance at edc there's yeah. Uh, party organizers that are doing, you know, events that we have host stages because it is important. We we don't we don't own it. We don't want to own it. Yeah. We, you know, it's 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 a it's a community and supporting other people brings that excitement. And yeah. I get inspired by brand new promoters that are in the scene. Yep. And people, you know, there's even people that are doing stuff internationally that that are that's inspiring to me. Yeah. You know, and um it keeps you wanting to do better. Yeah. You know, versus being the the, the only one. Um, yeah, there has true. been moments like that, but I've been bummed when when like the scene crashes and burns and people scatter yeah. whether cuz they're afraid cuz of new laws that have been put in place. You know, I got indicted at one point, right? Yeah. Uh and you know, that was a hard time and a lot of you know, there's been times where it's there's a lot of activity and there's not, and it's a lot better when there's a lot of different people in the scene yeah. put, putting yeah, their, right. their own, you know, their own uh, version of what of what they think is is awesome together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. It's very smart and mature, and uh, like I just I like the moment of like I run this shit. I'm the king of this. Yeah, you are. Anyway, we'll move on. Yeah, I know you're you humble. Know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted. To, I wanted. To, I, I just. I love those moments. Um, so, like, then I'm guessing too. At as this stuff starts to grow, you're having to actually build a real company, right? And hire talented people, and like, really. I mean, you've built. How many people work for you now? Over over 100, 110 people, and that's um, full time year round. Full time year round, not yeah, counting that, obviously not all the people that work at an event. Or yeah, we that. we hire thousands of yeah. people throughout the year yeah but you know i went through this you know I, unfortunately we're, we're diving into the business side of things here and there yeah and i actually grew a little bit too fast for a moment there i had to um restructure my company recently really? because what you know i i 
I did this on my own at one point. Yeah. And I would book the talent. I would make the flyer, yeah. pass out the flyer, book the DJ, book the production, find the venue, you know, uh, pick That's up the, the ticket money from the from the retail outlet, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. drop off flyers in the retail outlet at, at the same time, you know. Um, and at one point I found myself, or it took like, you know, I grew and it was good when I had like 30 people and 40 people. And we were talking a little earlier about how many people you have here yeah. working at your, at your company. Yeah. And you're not rushing to like blow things up. You're, you're taking it step by step, keep right? Keep it manageable. And yeah. I, at one point, got caught up on just throwing people at everything. Yep. And I got a little fat, you mm -hmm. know? It was mm -hmm. like what one, per one person used to take on 10 responsibilities. Yeah. I had 10 people doing 10 responsibilities. Yep. So I had to figure out, you know, how to become a more efficient, mm -hmm. pr productive company. There was so much red tape and it was so difficult to get things done. It was yeah. like, for me, back in the day, it was just so simple. You yeah, just do it. That's the classic problem of like scaling a business, you know? I never understood. People said to me, you know, it's hard when you grow. Yeah. You know, it's it can get difficult, and I I didn't understand that until I went through it. It's like, what? What do you mean? Growing is amazing. Yeah, like, like, that's I the grow. easy part. Just hire people, right? Yeah. And it it got hard, and you know, again, things with you know, we weren't making announcements on time. It was we weren't getting stuff done, and, and things weren't even being done as as well. Yep. With with more people, yeah, so is, yeah, you just don't think that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. So just recently. You know, we were at 150. I went down to 110, and we were we're already we're already operating better. Yeah. And what and, did you what do you think you shifted like? You know, mentally, like um, like one thing that I feel to your point is having a smaller amount of people that are actually really passionate about the work and clear on the work and sort of a hierarchy is or a proper flow of management is way more valuable than having those extra people like did you go through anything like that where you tried to like did you you restructured everything you tried to you tried to instill kind of the company values in everyone like did you go through that phase yeah. you did huh yeah core values because before you didn't have to explain core values yeah, you just show and what the see company it, does see it to at people. the party <laughs> i mean we, we you know and we still hire you know people that are from the you know we try to ha hire people from the dance floor and that really love this yeah. but it was, we, we've, we, we had a lot of people that just weren't, you know, it was just a job to them. Yeah. And it's a lifestyle, you know, where yeah. if we need to be at the office till four in the morning, we're happy to be there. Mm -hmm. We're so excited about getting stuff done. Yeah. We cannot wait to announce something to see people's reaction. Yeah. We live for it. You know, we want to, we want to, we want to come through. We wanted to be the best. Yep. And there was people that were just out, like they were waiting for the clock to strike yeah. six. Yeah. And that's just not how we got to where we where we are. Yep. So, yeah, we're in a much we're in a much better place. And I actually love you know some of the people that, that I had to, um, uh, cut from the company. It was a hard decision, one of the hardest things for me because I love all these people. Yeah. And but you know we're not not using them. We're just using them as independent contractors. Yeah. And you know the core. You know fo we have a more focused core team still 110 people yeah, it's a lot but um you know rather than and we're not really a pyramid it's a bunch of circles in the company yeah that's that's the new structure yep and like it, management and down of each area or no or more people, like here's the team that handles this exactly got it that that's been working you know got it um one of our big events of the year out of uh 110 people uh -huh. I had seven people, I, me being one of them, uh -huh. working on that show yeah. um, day in and day out, and it did better than when I had 35, 40 people working yeah. on it. It's funny how that so works, man. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, you gotta have people that, that love it, and uh, for, for us, for our company, yeah. it can't, you know, and uh, I mean, I guess that's for a, a, any job, right? Yeah, I think it's kind of a but value, a, there a, a, a a truth in any business i think we're fortunate because for instance i'm selling the young and reckless lifestyle and clothing and you're selling partying and uh and uh and electronic music whatever you, you have your whole thing i have my thing i think when it's hard is when you're like running like an accounting office and trying to instill like some sort of 
culture. But you know what I mean? <laughs> That's, like I think I feel bad yeah, for those people. Or yeah. maybe, you know, like a, whatever a really boring, just hard business to create a culture, right? But you yeah. still have to try. Um, I think that's the difficult part, but I do think it's a truth in any organization. Yeah, you know, like having to try to create that. Accounting was my one of my toughest departments. Yeah, but I have some really amazing gotta, people. Actually, yeah. I, ironically, I do have people that are like old school ravers in the accounting that's department so good. that are kill that are killing it. That yeah. are super passionate. So, if you know your thing, you can find the people to fit into it. Right? Yeah, it's they, when you don't know what the fit even is. Yeah. They know when they're when they're working on a show budget that they're, it's not about you know they're they're putting a party together they're 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 making people happy they're you know that they're working on numbers mm-hmm. and making sure that we pay the sound company the DJ and all that stuff and everything's done but they're really working for you know they they get the same joy of people being you know stoked to the gratification that people get out of going to the events. Yeah. And that's what makes that's what gives it the of, edge. Yeah, that's what makes those kind of jobs gratifying knowing that it's much bigger than that spreadsheet, right? So Cuz the other options for a rave loving accountant are not good. <laughs> <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. Not good other job opportunities. Yeah. Um <laughs> do you, did you like would you say that you you have any sort of mentor or like big books that you read or like are you just kind of learning this stuff from being a smart guy and just going through it? Yeah, Steve Jobs, yeah. you know, Walt Disney, yeah. um, Bill Graham. Those, those are some of the people. But, I mean, I there's so much. I mean, I get inspired all the time, you know. Even being in your office and seeing what you have going on here, I mean, yeah. it's inspiring to me. You know, we, you. we're diving into uh, uh, clothing ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know Rick Klotz from Fresh Drive? I do. Not so, well, but I know who he is. Yeah, so I've I was a huge fan. Yeah, of everything he did back in the day. You know, when I used to go to raves, uh, I would search out like f- on Melrose. You know, when a fresh drive shirt came yeah. out, I want to make sure I got one before they all sold out. Yeah, and then he had um, another surf uh, line. Yeah, uh, his, uh, what was the name of it? I'm blanking on what it was called. And that will help find it. We'll find it. Anyways, um, so Rick Klotz is someone who I've always, uh, I was inspired by, another yep. person I was inspired by. And now he's part of the That's so part cool. of the team, yep. and he's taken our clothing to a whole nother level. That's so good. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. So it's, it's cool so to see cool. what you have going on here. How many, thank you, man. How many, yeah, I just, I just, I love asking those questions, not only for the podcast, but because I'm, I go through it too, right? You go through these different learning experiences and you're scaling and you're hiring more people and that seems like the right thing to do and then you learn that maybe you overhired and then you learn that company cult. I remember for years I would hear or read books about company culture and to be honest, I'd kind of be like, that's stupid. Like, right. we have so much fun here, we're fine. You know, right. but you don't realize how things can kind of drift in and out of your control if you don't have a set set of values or what your company you know what i mean like you just have to have a way as as you're scaling as you're hiring new people to make sure that they're clear on what your company even stands for really and what are the do we come in super early do we come are we a little uh easy on hours or even those little details i think are so important you know Uh, it's it's easy when you're small and yeah the people that you have around you are they get it yep right it's when you when you get a little larger and you think they get it but they they really they you have to yeah explain it and and make sure they understand and um the company culture was was organic yep and now at the at the size that that we're at we have to lay it out a little more yep and also do some group you know group events and yeah, do you do you do like yeah. group team building yeah Oh, that's great. Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, we do a company retreat once a year. Where do you go? Like what type we've, of thing? We we've we've switched it up a bit. But last time we went to La Quinta Resort. Yep. Out in uh, in Palm Springs, and we had, you know, uh, what do you call uh, sack? Uh, what do you call these sack races? Sack races. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, balloon so tosses, cool. trust and falls, stuff like that. But I mean, we're you know, where everyone's, uh, you know. 
drunk and stuff. I mean, yeah. it's, it's fun. It's fun. People get together. We go to like a local bar. People do karaoke. I mean, it, that, you know, when we were smaller, we would just have fun. Just and it's so easy. We were just go to a party. To, go to one of your own together. parties. Yeah. And you know, now we now we do things like that. And I don't even know if that. It's it's still it's still challenging, you know. I don't yeah. even know if that's the right thing to do. Yeah. I think the new way, the new restructuring of getting small teams to work together yeah. on projects versus people being at their desks, yeah. you know, round tables mm -hmm. of ten people, five people, and th that's their event. Yeah. That's their project. Yeah. I think that that's really been working. I don't even know that we're going to need to. I mean, we'll, we're still going to do some stuff that's fun together, but I don't think we need to. I, I don't know if I've been feeling the company retreat thing. It feels a little like corny, forced. Yeah. No, it feels yeah a little a little forced. But yeah. um, I you know being I mean, there's nothing like for me. There's nothing like loving what you're doing. The person next to you loving what they're doing, and you connecting on the project. Yep. Like. It's that simple. It is. But it's like, that's what creates the magic. What I've found is that's kind of what creates the magic in the beginning. But sustaining that and scaling that is so hard. But you always need that feeling. You have to. Even if there's a thousand people, you need to be excited about the project and the person next to you is excited about the project. Sounds so simple, but it's, it's, it, you get, it, if when you start losing that, you know, it's, it's, it's not, well, for me, it doesn't even make, like, I want to be part, it's not what I want to do. Yeah. So, but we we are we we, we had a little um, time period there where that was I was worried that that was being lost and we're getting ahead of it and yeah. I'm I'm stoked I mean we just had our best uh, one of our best um, on sales for EDC Vegas which is our largest event of the year yeah and this is when hip hop's like massive right now and yeah people are you know um, it feels like some of the it's, it's dance music, you know, got trendy for a minute. Yeah. And it's not like the trendy thing. Hip hop's the trendy thing right now. Yeah. Which, you know, and, and we just, we're doing great. Yeah. I feel like it's because of that synergy. It's not because. It's the brand, man. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not because, uh, you know, I felt like for a minute there we had to ride off of all the love and hard work that was put in in the past. Yeah. Because we weren't doing anything that innovative and the, passion wasn't sp spewing out of like the projects we were doing mm -hmm. and some of the art was being lost and the creativity was being lost and yeah. it was just like you know i feel like we're back we're back there and it's perfect timing because there's a lot of changes going on right now yeah so i'm i'm stoked i'm i'm really happy i haven't been that happy in, in a long time yeah that's so, huge yeah huge um just quickly how just so i can get an idea of like the scale of it all like how many events will you do in 2018 uh, events, uh, we do hundreds in of total. events. So we do, uh, my passion is the, the festivals and the okay. underground parties uh, that are in non-traditional venues like warehouses and fields and stuff like that. Yep. But we do hundreds of like, we do palladium shows. Got it. We do clubs. Jesus Christ. We have weeklies. But How many of the festival type thing? Between 18 to 25, depending on the year. And when I, I'm including like a bass rush party, which is a one stage bass music party, yeah, or a multi stage eight stage event yeah. where there's uh, you know a hundred thousand people there, um, so those one offs, I, I I really enjoy those, and you know we do we do a good amount of those, and we're expanding internationally right now, which is exciting. That's crazy. And what roughly can you give me a rough head count for the year for those events? Like how many people go to EDC? EDC Vegas. Yeah, we do over four hundred thousand tickets over the three days. Jesus. But Insomniac, we do over a million tickets a year. Yeah, that's uh, all our events climb. Yeah, that's not just the that's that's everything that we do. That's but if that's that's been growing, it might be yeah. So and managing that with a hundred people is impressive. It's uh, that's a shit ton of like moving parts. Yeah, I have a, I have an uh, amazing, amazing you know team. Yeah, could not do it without them. Um, you, 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 to handle it, you know that growth is necessary. I just I went a little overboard too too yeah, quickly, but, but I see how you could. Yeah, in that you know that's a lot to manage. Yeah. Um, okay, last thing, and then I'll let you go. I always ask this: You've been through a shit ton. You've learned a lot. Uh, you've built this incredible property. If you could 
run in to the younger version of yourself, let's say you're eight years old walking around the Venice boardwalk sort of with all this responsibility and probably big dreams and a lot of creativity. Is there anything that you, any little gem that you would give yourself now being through all of this that would maybe help uh, make things a little easier? Never assume anything. Even the, you know, some, I've gotten in trouble sometimes and made mistakes from assuming something will work out. You got to think anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So you just, and, you know, communicating, uh, people can't mind reading. Even, even in the office today, sometimes I forget. And it's about, it ties into the company culture thing. Yeah. You think people get it and they just, they, they, you know, you have to, um, you know, always assume that this, you know, every anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I've taken a lot, and you, you got to take risks, and and you got to just calculated risks. Yeah. But you know, I made made some mistakes. Like I did, I did a um, nocturnal, which was my first festival I ever did, uh -huh. and I did it. Uh, on an Indian reservation because I had lost my spot uh -huh. and I um, <laughs> I uh, put put it together really quickly. I should have probably um, not done, I should have probably like postponed the event. Yeah, you know? yeah. Little things like that because it was, you know, I got shot at, you know, I got chased off the reservation. Jesus. And it was crazy, you know. <laughs> I, I At the same time, I wouldn't trade any of those experiences for anything. Yeah, yeah. Because it's made, I learned so much from them. Yeah. But, you know, just for me, you know, I just, you know, I, 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 I'm, I always think like everything's going to work out and yeah. it, it's a good way to think, Yeah, it is. but still plan for, for it not to, for not to yeah. think of every angle that, you know, cover, cover all your bases, you know, everything needs to be perfect, you know, yeah. and that was always my goal. But, um, you know, I feel like I could have been a little bit more responsible with like, that, for instance, I yep. should have just postponed it. Yeah. But I was—I felt the pressure. Don't do—don't do anything out of pressure, you know. Yeah, yeah. I had like almost forty thousand tickets sold. I couldn't let the people down. Yeah. You know, I think they would have appreciated it more if I just postponed the event, did it somewhere where it was a little bit more safe. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there wasn't like chaos, people shooting total at chaos. You. But yeah. But those were the, you know, at the same time. You know, there really wasn't a lot of options back there yeah. back then. Yeah. So reservations was our go-to for a lot of those parties back yeah. then. But it. yeah, it just you know, I mean, that was a, that was that was something that I, that yeah. I learned. Never give up. But I, yeah. I, you know, that was something that I didn't. I never did give up. But you know, I'll. I'll I mean, that's really why I'm still here. Yeah, that lesson is in that, your entire. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the the biggest thing is yeah. there's going to be challenges. I mean, I know there's uh, the memes online that show like. The road to success is all like crooked. Yeah. So, I mean, it's you know, it's really though. I mean, I've I've thought I was done, yeah, a hundred times, but I didn't stop. You know, it didn't make me stop ever. I, yeah, you know, you I, thought I, so. I was negative in my account. Checks were coming in to get cleared. Yeah, you know, I lost millions of dollars. I got indicted. I got arrested. I got you know Shot the at. media. <laughs> Uh, was attacking me. I yeah. got shot at. I got, you know, everything you could think of has happened. Yep. And I'm still here. And so happy as ever. Like, yeah. you don't carry it around with you. You have a happy, like, vibe. You know, <laughs> well, you don't look like the yeah. world is, like, weighted on you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You enjoy yourself. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I love it, man. I love life. I love life. I love people. Um, you know, even about loving people. Like, I've been, don't get discouraged by getting betrayed. Yeah. I've been betrayed a hundred times from, you know, it's unfortunate because people make mistakes and they do it for whatever they're, they're, they're not in the right place. They don't even know what they're doing. And, you know, sh shit happens, you know, yeah. but you need to have faith in people. You can't give up. You have to love people. You have to trust people. You can't operate from being, you can't be afraid to make yeah. moves yeah. and you just got to take, just keep moving it's when you get bogged down by the indictment yeah when i was indicted i was indicted for like years yeah you know and i courts and wearing suits i don't you know like it yeah. sucked 
but an indictment lingering over my head for years probably would have killed me. Yeah, but you know what? It wouldn't because you would just ignore the fact. Like it, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's you know, I feel it's cliche to kind of say this stuff because these days you see it so much of it promoted online. But really, I mean, it's it really you know, it's 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 it worked for me, and uh, I just I almost block it out, yep. and it allows me to move forward. Even with getting dicked over on a personal level, they say an individual has hurt me or stole from me or something, because that happens in, you know, in life. Yeah. And I don't even, I'm not even mad at them. Yeah. I'm not even angry with them because that can bog you down too. Yeah. So you just keep it moving and focus on, you know, make excuses for the negative people in your life on, you know, that's their, their issues. Yeah. And, um, don't beat yourself up. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's 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 worked out for me. Yeah. You know, I feel real, really recharged right now because I'm so excited about you know these changes I made in the company. Yeah. And um, you know, if you're if you're not feeling something, you just make sure you know do your best. You know, change change things up and yeah. find that happiness for yourself. And the day that I don't enjoy this, I'll you're stop. Done. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't see that day coming anytime soon. And I want to come to an event. No, please come and let's let's hang out. I'd love to you host you. Yeah. yeah. I forget. I thought. Did we only hung out at like a club or something. Something, right? yeah. I forget where, but really briefly. It was like a Vegas club for a minute. And yeah. It wasn't really. Now, I would love to show you. I'd love to give you a tour. And yeah, I just got to do it the right way. You. I'd love to show you what we're doing with our clothing. I would love to see it. I'd love to come to the office. Yeah. Done. Rick is a creative genius. Oh, I bet. He's amazing. A legend. Yeah. Um, anything, any plugs, anything to plug? I know we got the PR team here. Do we have any, tell people, I mean, everyone knows where to go, right? Yeah, if, if you know, for those who for those who don't for those who don't know, you can get information about our events and everything else we're up to on insomniac.com. Easy. Done. Thank you, man. Thanks cool. for making this happen. Yeah, thank you. Hell yeah.